Njáls saga is normally seen as the crowning glory of the saga canon. It should therefore not come as a surprise that no saga is preserved in more manuscripts than Njáls saga. On the whole, between 60 and 70 manuscripts are preserved. Many of them are only fragments, but compared to most other sagas, it's an abundance of manuscripts. By comparing them, we can often see how individual scribes shape the material they have by adding, modifying or deleting particular words or sentences. Of course, we cannot always be sure whether these are deliberate changes or simply slips of the pen. Svanhildur Óskarsdóttir, research professor at the Arte Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies in Reykjavík, was the principal investigator of a project called The Variants of Njálsaga, which ran between 2011 and 2013. The aim of the project was to examine the variants of Njálsaga from a linguistic, philological and literary perspective, both synchronically, as regards the earliest manuscripts, which date from the 14th century, and diachronically, by cataloging changes that take place over time. In other words, the project sought to show what the living tradition of Njál saga was like at different stages of the saga's transmission. In 2018, the project's results will be published in print. I sat down with Svanhildur, who showed me some of the most important manuscripts of Njál saga. Njál saga. The first manuscript we have is called Thormos book, or the book of Thormóður. Uh, so, let's begin with the name. Who was Thormóður? Thormóður Torvason, or Torfeus, as he Latinized his name, was an Icelander, uh, born in the 17th century, lived into the 18th century a little bit. He was uh, a royal Danish historian, and uh, for instance wrote an extensive history of Norway, which at that time was part of the realm of Denmark, uh, and for this, his historical activities, of course, he needed sources and he needed uh, Icelandic sources. So he had uh, access to manuscripts that were in the royal library, but he also acquired some manuscripts of his own. And he may have owned this one, which is uh, called Thormos book. Uh, he certainly had it in his hands at some point because he has written here at the front Vantar hér að framan í njálu, so meaning uh, here before there is something lacking from njálsaga. Uh, and this manuscript is one of the oldest of njálsaga. There are bits missing, it's a fragment really, it only contains about one fourth of the whole text. Uh, it was written at the beginning of the 14th century, so around or little after 1300, so it's really, really old. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it later came into the uh, collection of Árni Magnússon uh, after it had been with Thormóður. One of the uh, variation that exists between the various manuscripts of Njálsa, even in the oldest manuscripts like this one, is the amount of poetry that is included. That, that is to say that some manuscripts have more stanzas than do the others. Uh, poetry in the saga, it sort of delays uh, the action for, it, it, it creates a kind of a, a rest, you could say, in the text sometimes. So um, if you opt for uh, describing certain things in poetry rather than prose, it means kind of it slows the text down a bit. This scribe here, having the option of using stanzas or poetry or telling the same or giving the same information in prose usually opts for the prose. So you could say that this makes for a slightly faster paced narrative in this manuscript. Uh, the way individual scribes copy the text of Njálsa may sometimes give us some idea of their preferences, if you like. Um, although the story stays essentially the same, throughout. Uh, the farm at Bergfosskvot, for instance, always gets burnt down. No scribe omits that. Mm. But they may omit other things that they find less interesting. And the scribe of uh, Thormo spoke, it seems he was not too keen on all the legal wrangles in the saga. Mm. So he shortened 
those bits. And he's not alone. There are scribes. Several other manuscripts have uh, also a bit. You know, those parts are shortened. Mm. Uh, so even at the beginning of the 14th century, there were presumably readers uh, or listeners uh, that, like some of us today get slightly bored with a really, really extensive treatment of the legal matters in Njolsa. But you can also uh, see when you get down to the kind of lexical level, uh, there are also slight variations that can perhaps, again, reveal something about the scribe's background. In this manuscript, we are lucky then that in that even though it's very fragmentary, it, it uh, contains the description of the escalation of hostilities between uh, Bergþórskvot and Hlíðarendi when Bergþóra and Hallgerður sent their servants to kill the other's servants. Uh, and uh, in, in one of these episodes where uh, Bergþóra's servant Þórður Leysingjason goes to Hlíðarendi in search of Hallgerður's servant in order to kill him, uh, he meets Hallgerður uh, and she asks her where he could find her man, Brynjúlfur, and uh, Hallgerður remarks something like like that, that doesn't matter uh, where he is or, or if uh, Thorir finds him, even if it finds him, she doesn't believe that he will be able to kill him. And uh, concurring with this, uh, Thorir says, I have never seen man's blood, or oh, that's the text in most manuscripts, except that in this manuscript, uh, the word mansbloth, man's blood, is replaced by heftarbloth, blood spilt in hate, or something like that, mm. in revenge. So it's a much more loaded word than simply the neutral man's blood. And this uh, word, heftarbloth, is quite rare in Old Icelandic. It occurs for the first time in uh, Veraldarsaga, which is a kind of a universal history which describes, among other things, the killing of Abel by Cain, or oh, that's where this word crops up. Mm. So by including this word in the text, uh, the scribe creates, uh, consciously or not, an allusion to kind of Christian uh, ideas about uh, the first killing. And uh, yeah, it's a kind of a biblical, biblical reference. Mm -hmm.